centre, an important centre amid a trade network, and because it was the place where they, they ended up. Uh, it's one of the centres with the greatest continuity and reaches its apogee in the reign of uh, Sultan Alaeddin Kekubad, uh, who rules from 1220 to 1237. And he's responsible for building several uh, institutions within the, the historical fabric of Konya. Well, they're under extant today. You can visit them. <laughs> The great Seljuk Sultan Alaeddin presided over a cultural renaissance in Konya and built a number of fine 13th century monuments. These include the Alaeddin Mosque with its ornately carved minbar or pulpit and several theological colleges. It becomes a, a centre for uh, the Mevlevi Sufi group um, who follow the, the thinking and the writings of uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi, um, who dies in the late 13th century. But it's you know one of several um, mystical groups within Islam that comes to the fore uh, in this period, although it's predominant in Anatolia. Mevlana, or Rumi, the founder of the whirling dervishes, was also a major poet, and his tomb here is now an important pilgrimage site. In a sense, his poetry isn't overtly didactic, um, but his, the, the, the cumulative legacy of his thinking and his way of living become um, institutionalized, if you will, like several other Sufi groups uh, within the milieu of, of Konya and Anatolia. The Rumi, his philosophy is a kind of forgiveness or tolerance. What he says, uh, come come, come again, whoever, it doesn't matter. You could be Jew, Christian, or fire worshipper, or Buddhist, or whatever, or you could, if you break your faith hundred times, come again. There is no hopelessness with us. Our place is full of hope. So this is a kind of lifestyle. This is a lifestyle. All his life, all his books are uh, trying to teach people how to get happy ending. Central to the practices of his order is, of course, their whirling dance. This whirling means the person, single person, goes to God, unity with the God. Uh, during the dance, right hand is upright, open, left hand is downright, meaning I am having from God giving to the people. Uh, the turban on top is a tombstone, symbolizing tombstone. And the white dress is like a burial dress means this person already gone out from this material world. He joined to his God. Now he is over there. If there is an aspect uh, that really mark Seljuk period art as being quite distinct from what had come before in the Islamic tradition. Uh, it's the rise of the human figure, um, which is generally associated with um, developments in philosophy that create a new position for man, a sort of a humanism um, that stresses man's ability to perfect himself and to develop his virtue. And the subject matter appears across a broad variety of medium We've come now to what is arguably the highlight of the show, this room dedicated to the works of an artist known as Mohammed of the Black Pen, a man so revered in Turkey that he's never before been exhibited outside Turkey, indeed he's never been even been able to exhibited inside Turkey. So important are his works to Turkish culture. And they are the subject of extreme speculation, these fantastic pictures as to what exactly is going on in these fascinating, almost Bruegelian scenes of 
donkeys, devils, nomads, and dervishes. The black pen drawings are a continuing paradox within the field of Islamic art simply because uh, they've generated one of the largest literatures and yet I would argue that we're no closer to really understanding them than we were before this large body of literature. Um, I think it's because they are such powerful subjects, um, powerful in visual terms, powerful in their subject matter, they're incredibly robust, elusive, enigmatic, uh, starkly silhouetted figures against blank paper grounds and executed in a style that is completely unlike everything that we know from the art of the book um, and painting that was made within the context of royal courts. Even the artist's name, Muhammad Sia Kalam, Muhammad of the Black Pen, referring to a technique of drawing, was added at a later date so it may not even have been his name. We know no stories that might illustrate or provide meanings for these pictures. Scholars have tended to see the paintings as reflecting an actual lived experience, as if they're a kind of a reportage or a, a, a photo documentary. So they've used the paintings as a source from which to extract plausible scenarios about where he might have lived, when he might have lived. Um, I think that most people generally agree today that he was active in the 14th century and probably somewhere in Iran or Central Asia. It's definite that these pictures are done by some nomads, are the, paint, uh, are the pictures or paintings of some nomadic people who are on the move. The fact that these people are moving like Turks from one place to another and using things they have found on the way and constantly changing themselves. They do not look like Islamic miniatures, rather some strange, mysterious paintings with some sort of a Central Asian or Chinese or uh, influence. Then the fact that, that we cannot attribute them easily to a single source makes them mysterious and this mystery is perfectly appropriate for the Turkish identity because it gives also a sense of nom nomadic migration. Life must have been pretty grim for the characters in the black pen drawings, but on the steps in the 1380s there was an even more terrifying phenomenon and his name was Timur or Tamburlaine the Great. We're halfway through our 1000 year journey exploring the cultural riches of the Turks, from Central Asia to the Balkans. A storm of horseback is how the chroniclers describe Tamburlaine and his hordes sweeping across the plains. And this room is dedicated to the achievements of Tamburlaine, that fantastic warrior conqueror you see here, Tam Timurid armor, an inscription of a conquest over there, and over there, an extraordinary picture of Tamburlaine and his troops hurling from the walls of Baghdad, the slaughtered victims of that captured city. In the West, we think we know a lot about Timur's notorious exploits because of Christopher Marlowe's play Tamburlaine. This version of his name comes from Timur the Lame because of his wounded leg. But how much of it can we be sure is true? Timur was probably one of the greatest self-made uh, men who ever lived, the greatest conqueror. He came from extremely humble origins in the heart of Central Asia, born near Samarkand. And by the end of his career, he was undefeated and had trounced the greatest Islamic conquerors of the region of the Middle East. The sway of Tamerlane's empire was, was astonishing. In the west, he went as far as the Aegean, having conquered Turkey. He could have gone on further west into the heart of Europe, but there was no point at that time. The, Europe had no money. It really was not attractive from a point of view of someone bent on rape and pillage and destruction. He went as far south as Delhi, almost as a conscious effort to outdo both Alexander and Genghis before him. In the north, he went as far as Siberia. And in the east, he pressed on into Mongolia, where he died uh, at the age of 69 en route to battle with the Ming Emperor, the only adversary on earth that he thought was worthy of a fight at that time. Timur.